Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome back to the Castro Good day. I don't know. I guess it depends on what time it. Yeah. It is when you guys are turning, uh, tuning into the show. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm great. How about yourself? Awesome. Nice. Awesome. So first and foremost, go out, give us a little like and subscribe if you the don't love. mind um, on the YouTube channel. Share it out if you don't mind as well. I'm going to get into a creepy exorcism story. Okay. Some of you guys may recall it, recall the story. It's kind of called, it's about the hell house okay. that Zach Baggins from Ghost Adventures had purchased okay. a while back. And he actually has the staircase he does. in his haunted museum in Las We've Vegas. We've seen it. Yeah, it's creepy. We went Even and... just it being there by itself, uh-huh. it's still creepy. Still gives you weird vibes. Yeah, that whole place is I creepy. was going to say, the whole museum gives you weird vibes. If you've yeah. never gone and you have a chance, it's really it's cool. You should it. go check it out. Yeah, so this is this story will be about the family okay. that is impacted by the demon possessions. Real quick, before I forget, go out, check us. All the photos are available out on yes. Instagram, Instagram under the Castro files. You can find them all out there. And if you're into the audio ver- versions or just listening to you know podcasts, check us out on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere you can pretty much find a podcast. Cool. So with that, we'll jump right in. So this is from the Indie Star, written by Marissa Kwiatkowski, The Exorcisms, Exorcisms of LaToya Amons. Okay. From 2014. So a woman and with three children who claimed to be possessed by demons. A nine-year-old boy walking backwards up, up a wall in the presence of a family case manager and a hospital nurse. Gary Police Captain Charles Austin said it was the strangest story he had ever heard. Austin, a 36-year veteran of the Gary Police Department, said he initially thought Indianapolis resident Latoya Ammons and her family concocted an elaborate tale as a way to make money. But after several visits visits to their home and interviews with witnesses, Austin simply said, I am a believer. Hmm. Not everyone involved with the family was inclined to believe its incredible story, and many readers will find Eamon's supernatural claims impossible to accept. But whatever the cause of the creepy occurrences that befell the family, whether they were seized by a systematic delusion or a demonic possession, it led to one of the most unusual cases that ever that was ever handled by the Department of Child, Ser- Child Services. Okay. Many of the events are detailed in the nearly 800 pages of official records obtained wow. by the Indianapolis Star and recounted in more than a dozen interviews with police, DCS personnel, psychologists, family members, and a Catholic priest. Hmm. Amons, who swears by her story, has been unusually open. While she spoke on condition that, that her children not be interviewed or named, she signed releases letting the star review medical, psychological, and official records that are not open to the public, and not always flattering. Furthermore, the family story is made only more bizarre because it involves DCS direct intervention, a string of psychological evaluations, a police investigation, and ultimately a series of exorcisms. Wow. Yeah. It's a tale, they say, that started with flies. This is not normal. In November of 2011, Amon's family moved into a rental house on Carolina Street in Gary, a quiet, quite quiet lane lane lined with small one story homes black flies suddenly swarmed their screened in porch in December despite the winter chill this is not normal Eamon's mother Rosa Campbell remembers thinking we killed them and killed them and killed them but they kept coming back there were other strange happenings too after midnight Campbell and Eamon's both said they occasionally heard a steady clump of footsteps climbing the basement stairs and the creak of the door opening between the basement and the kitchen. Yikes. No one was there. Even after they locked the door, the noise continued. Campbell said she awoke one night and saw a shadowy figure of a man pacing her living room. She leapt out of bed to investigate and found a large, wet boot prints. On March, wow. 10, March 10th, 2012, Campbell said the family's unease turned to fear. Yeah. This is where it gets a bit creepy, too. 12-year-old levitates. It was about 2 a.m. Normally, Campbell, Amons, and her children would have been asleep, but they were mourning the death of a loved one with a group of friends. Amons, who was in Campbell's bedroom, startled everyone by screaming, Mama, Mama. Campbell said she ran into her bedroom where her her then 12-year-old granddaughter and friend were staying. 
Amons and Campbell said that the 12-year-old was le- levitating above the bed. Oh, my un- gosh. Unconscious. Oh. So just imagine little kids. Yeah. Little, yeah. Kids are creepy anyway, but <laughs> add levitation. Right. According to their account of events, Amons and several others surrounded the girl praying. I don't, I don't know if I'd be praying or if I'd... I don't know what I'd do. Campbell... Taking her down. Yeah. And she re- remember being terrified. I thought, what's going on, Campbell said. Why is this happening? Eventually, Campbell said her granddaughter descended onto the bed. The girl wake, woke up with no memory of what happened. Campbell and Amons said that the people who were visiting that night refused to return. Yeah, you think? This is where they start thinking they're possessed by demons. Campbell says she remembers telling her daughter, we need help. We need to talk to someone who knows how to deal with this. Campbell and Ammons said that they didn't know exactly what it, quote unquote, was, but they believed it was something supernatural. They called local churches, but most refused to listen. Eventually, after listening to Campbell and Ammons talk about the house and visiting it, officials at one church told them that they told the Carolina Street House had spirits in it. They recommend the family clean the home with bleach and ammonia, then use oil to draw crosses on every door and window. At the church's suggestion, Amon said she was she poured olive oil on her three children's hands and feet, then smeared oil in the shape of crosses on their foreheads. Campbell and Amon's also told the star that they reached out to two clairvoyants. This I don't know if I would do. So who said the family's home was besieged by more than 200 demons. Oh, Lord. Their explanation made sense to Campbell and Amons, they say, because it meshed with their Christian faith. The best thing you can do is move, Amons remembers the clairvoyance telling her, but moving wasn't an option for the Castrap family. Instead, she said they took the clairvoyance advice and made an altar in the basement. They covered an end table with a white sheet, then placed a white candle and a statue, statue of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus on it. She opened a Bible opened a Bible to Psalm 91, she said she and another person donned white t-shirts and wound scarves around their heads. Also on a clairvoyant, on a clairvoyant's advice, they burned sage and sulfur throughout the house, starting, starting upstairs and working their way down. The smoke was so thick that they could hardly breathe. Yeah. Wow. Amons drew a cross with smoke. The person she said she was with read Psalm 91 aloud as they moved through the house. You will fear not the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. She said nothing odd happened for three days. Then okay. things got worse. So all of that worked for 72 nothing. hours. For nothing. Okay. The family said demons possessed Amons and her children, then ages 7, 9, and 12. The kids' eyes bulged. Evil smiles crossed their faces, Jeez. and their voices deepened every time it happened. She said the demons didn't affect her because she was born with protection from evil. It's where the psychological part okay. kind of starts coming in, right? She said, she said she and others like her have a guardian who protects them. Amon said she felt weak, lightheaded, and warm when she was possessed. Her body shook, and she said she felt out of control. You can't tell. You can tell it's different. It's something supernatural. Interesting. The youngest boy, then seven, sat in the closet talking to a boy that no one else could see. Whoa. The other boy was describing what it felt like to be killed. Oh, Lord. She said the seven-year-old once flew out of the bathroom as if he had been thrown, and a headboard once smacked into, Am- smacked into Amon's daughter's daughter, causing a wound that needed stitches. Yeah. The 12-year-old would later tell mental health professionals that she sometimes felt as if she were being choked and held down so she could speak, couldn't speak or move. Oh. She said she heard thing. Yeah, she heard voices that she'd never that she'd never see her family again and wouldn't live another twenty minutes. Oh shit. Like Excuse that's me. putting a timeline on I mean seriously. Things, right? Some nights were so bad that the family slept in the hotel. I would sleep in the hotel all the time. I know. Cash trapped, so Yeah. Finally, in desperation, they went to their family physician, Dr. Jeffrey, I can't say his last name, so I'm not going to try, on April 19th of 2012. She said that he told, she told them what they were going through, hoping he might understand. The doctor told the star it was bizarre. 20 years, and I've never heard anything like that in my life, he said. I was scared myself, and when I walked, and when I walked into the room, when I walked into the room, he said he would not speak in more details unless Amons had psychiatric clearance for a waiver of confidentiality she had signed. 
In his medical notes about the visit, the doctor wrote delusions of ghosts in home and hallucinations. Delusions, so he didn't believe her. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah most people probably. Yeah. He also wrote ghosts of history of ghosts at home and delusional. What Amons and Camel said happened next was also detailed in a DCS report of the family case manager's interviews with medical staff. He walked up the wall, flipped over her, and stood there. Campbell said Eamon's son cursed the doctor in demonic voices, raging at him. Medical staff said that the youngest boy was lifted and thrown into a wall with nobody touching him, according to a DCS report. Wow. The boys abruptly passed out and wouldn't come to, Campbell added. She cradled one of her boys in her arms, and Eamon's held the other. Someone from the doctor's office called 911. The doctor said eight, seven or eight police officers with multiple ambulances showed up. Oh, jeez. Everybody was... they. They couldn't figure out exactly what happened, he said. Police and emergency personnel took the boys to Methodist Hospital in Gary. Eamon said that the, doctor per- that the hospital personnel laughed at her desire to anoint her sons in olive oil. If you're a doctor, it's science, right? You're yeah. like, there's something going on. You're trying to think critically like that. It just could be a different way of having to think. Right. But in my head, I'm like, let her just do it then. Can't hurt. Right. I couldn't talk to them, she said, so I talked to God. The boys woke up in the hospital. Their older boy, then nine, acted rationally, but the youngest screamed and thrashed. She said it took five men to hold him down. Wow. Meanwhile, someone called DCS and asked the agency to investigate Evans for possible child child abuse or neglect. The caller, who is not named in the DCS report, speculated that Amos might have a mental illness. The person believed the children were performing for Amos, and she was encouraging their behavior. DCS family member, or fam, DCS family case manager Valerie Washington was asked to handle the initial investigation. She gave the following account to police, and in, in her intake officer's report, hospital personnel examined Amons and her children and found them to be healthy and free of marks or bruises. The hospital psychiatrist evaluated Amons and determined she was of sound mind. Washington in, interviewed the family in the hospital. While she spoke with Amons, the seven-year-old boy started growling and with his teeth showing. His eyes rolled back in his head. The boy locked his hands around his older brother's throat and refused to let go until adults pried his hands open. Keep in mind, this is in the case notes. Yeah. Oh, this is in the case notes? Okay, I didn't mm-hmm. know that. Okay. Later that evening, Washington was regi- and a registered nurse, Willie Lee Walker, brought the two boys into his small exam room for an interview. Campbell joined them. The seven-year-old stared into his brother's eyes and began to growl again. It's time to die. Wow. The boy said in a deep, unnatural voice, I will kill you. While the youngest boy spoke, the older brother started older brother started headbutting Campbell in the stomach. Campbell grabbed her grandson's hands and started praying. Oh my god. What happened next would rattle the witness, and to some it would offer not only evidence, but proof of paranormal activity. According to the Washington's to Washington's original DCS report, an account corroborated by Walker, the nurse, the nine-year-old had a weird grin and walked backwards up the wall to the ceiling. He then flipped over, landing on his feet, and never let go of his grandmother's hand. Ew. So he literally, his back was to the wall. Like this. He walked up the wall as if going, like, yeah. facing the floor. And then went and up. Then jumped down and just landed there but wouldn't he have torn his arm off i don't know that's weird that's just gave me goosebumps <laughs> that's weird he, yeah he so he walked up the wall flipped over her and stood there walker told the star there's no way that he could have done that later police asked washington whether the boy had run up the wall is like performing an acrobatic trick where you see parkour parkour right. and they run up and they'll like flip Jump over off. or something right like he ran up the wall and then flipped out no but. washington told them she said the boy glided glided backwards on the floor wall and ceiling like he yeah it's creepy and that's in the police report that's crazy washington washington did not understand or did not respond to the star's request for comment but she told police she was scared when it happened and ran out of the room for, uh, as Walker said, <laughs> for Walker. Washington said he ran out of the room with me. We didn't know what was going on. That was crazy. I was like, everybody's got to go. Like, get out. According to, Washington, to Washington's report, they told the doctor 
what happened. The doctor, who did not believe them, asked the boy to walk up the wall again. Walker said he, he told the doctor he doubted the boy could repeat the feat. This kid was not himself when he did that, Walker said. The boy didn't said he didn't remember mm-hmm. any of it happening, couldn't recall it, and couldn't do it again. Wow. Walker, who had previously believed in demons and spirits, thought the boy's behavior had some demonic spirit to it, but also was the result of you a think? mental illness. Oh. Uh, hmm. Kind of prey on the weak, maybe. Yeah, maybe. A police report quoted Washington saying she believed there could be an evil influence in fl- affecting the family. Separated, Eamon said she spent the night at the hospital with her seven-year-old while Campbell took Eamon's daughter and older son to a relative's home in, in Gary. Okay. The next day was Eamon's youngest, eight, uh, youngest son's eighth birthday. Eamon said DCS officials asked Campbell to bring the older children back to the hospital, presumably, presumably to talk about what happened. Family celebrated the boy's birthday by singing and eating miniature cake. Then Eamon said Washington told them the children wouldn't be going home. DCS took the emergency step of taking the children, taking custody of children without a court order. All of the children were experiencing spiritual and emotional distress. Amons told the star she had she and her children cried because they didn't want to be separated. Of course, yeah. We already have been through so much and fought so hard up for our lives. She recalled it was obvious we were a team and we were beating it. Whatever we were fighting, we made it through together as a team, and they separated us. So there's a picture that's going to come up here, and it's of a house, and it's of the house, Mm -hmm. and it's a very famous picture if you're into this kind of paranormal Mm -hmm. stuff, and it's got somebody standing in the window, but there's nobody there. There's nobody home. Creepy. Yeah. So Reverend Michael Maginot was leading a Bible study in his living room the morning of April 20th, 2012, when he received a call from a hospital chaplain. Maginot had been a priest at St. Stephen Martyr Parish in Maryville for some for more than 10 years and had never received a request like this one. The chaplain asked him to perform an exorcism on Amon's nine-year-old son. Maginot agreed to interview the family after Sunday Mass a few days later. The first step, Maginot said, was ruling out natural causes for what Amons and her family were experiencing. He visited Amons and Campbell in the Carolina Street home on April 22, 2012. For two hours, Amons and Campbell, de- Campbell, Campbell detailed the phenomena for him. Then Campbell, Campbell, having a hard time with that word all of a sudden, interrupted the interview to point out a flickering bathroom light. The flicker stopped each time Maginot walked over to investigate it. And he attributed it to, which he attributed to a demonic presence. Yeah, you think? Like, I don't know, faulty wiring, in one room, In one bathroom? Things like but that. But just one room? Yeah, it could be. You uh, know. yeah. One of those things, he said it must be scared of me, he later told the star. That's what he thought. Right. The interview was interrupted again when Campbell pointed out the Venetian blinds in the kitchen swinging, even though there was no air current. Maginot said he also saw wet footprints throughout the living room. Remember the boot prints? Yep. Amons complained about having a headache. Magino said she convulsed when he placed a crucifix against her head. After a four-hour interview, Magino said he was convinced the family was being tormented by demons. He also believed there were ghosts in the home. Magino blessed the house before la- leaving, praying, reading from the Bible, and sprinkling holy water in each room. He told them to leave the house because it wasn't safe, and they temporarily, temporarily moved in with a relative. Hmm. The Gary police captain starts to believe. But less than a week later, the two women were back on Carolina Street to, to let Washington, the DCS family case manager, check the condition of the home. Washington asked Lake County police officer to come with her as well. Two other officers, one from Gary and one from Hammond Police Departments, asked to join them out of professional uh, curiosity. Amons refused to go inside, but Campbell agreed to accompany the, the group. Amons' kids still were with, DC, with in DCS custody at the time. The main floor had three bedrooms, a living room, one bathroom, hardwood floors, and a small open-style kitchen. A door in a kitchen led to the basement with concrete floors. Directly under the stairs was a dirt floor. The concrete around it was jagged, like it had been broken through. 
I can picture it in my head. Me too. The makeshift altar Amens had created was still in place, along with rings of salt she had poured against the basement walls to dissuade the demons, according to the Hammond Police Department report. Campbell, Campbell told the officers that demons seemed to emanate from beneath the stairs. Austin, the Gary police captain, was one of those officers. He later told the Star he believed in ghosts and the supernatural, but said he didn't believe in demons. Austin said he changed his mind after visiting the Carolina Street House. Hmm. During the interview with Campbell, one of the officer's audio recorders malfunctioned. According to Austin and Hammond police records, the power light flashed to indicate the batteries were dying, even though the officer had placed fresh batteries in the recorder earlier that day. Another officer recorded audio, and when he played it back, he heard unknown voices whisper, Hey, according to Lake County police records. Creepy. That's where it gets creepy. When yeah. it's in, like, like formal documentation. Yeah. Right? And you... <laughs> right? That officer also took photos of the house. In one of the photos of the basement stairs, there's a cloudy white image in the upper right-hand corner. When an officer enlarged the photo, that cloud appeared to resemble a face. Yikes. Lakewood County Police Records state, The enlargement also revealed a second green image that police say looked like a female. Austin said photos he snapped with his iPhone also seemed to have strange silhouettes in them. The radio in his police-issued Ford malfal malfunctioned on the way home as well. Later, Austin said the garage of his Gary home refused to open, even though the power was on and everything. Hmm. Austin said the driver's seat in his personal 2005 Infinity had also started moving backwards and forwards on its own. He said the car, he'd just had the car checked at the dealership, and the mechanic told him that the motor in the driver's seat was broken all of a sudden which the mechanic said could have caused a dis distraction leading to an accident. So yeah. if the seat all of a sudden- So it was the, pa it was the driver's, not the passenger's. The driver's seat. So okay. it started just moving back and forth. While he's driving. If it had, it could have led to an accident. Yeah, you think? Yeah. That's creepy. Austin said he's found himself starting to believe Eamon's claims of paranormal activity, but the mental health professionals evaluating Eamon's and her children remain skeptical. How much? I don't know. I mean, how much do you have to see and experience in order to start believing? But yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that there are, if there was a, like a history or something like that, but there was no history of this fan of ever having issues, right? Right. They were hardworking people. Yeah. And there was no history of anybody in the house having issues before that though, too. Right. So, so we're going to get on to the DCS plan. Okay. So in April 12th or April of 2012, DCS petitioned Lake Juvenile Court for temporary wardship of the three children and were granted uh, the request. DCS found Amon's neglected her children, children's education by not having them in school regularly. The agency made the same findings in 2009. As the records show, Amons was told Washington there were many times she could not send the kids to school because the spirits would make them sick or they would be up all night without sleep. Interesting. DCS temporarily placed her daughter and older son at St. Josephine's uh, home in East Chicago. Amons' youngest son went, was sent to Christian Haven in Wheatfield for psychiatric evaluation. Clinical psychologist Stacy Wright, who evaluated Amons' youngest son, said the boy tended to act possessed when he was challenged, redirected, or asked questions he didn't want to answer. In her evaluation, uh, Wright wrote that he seemed coherent and logical except when he talked about demons. So, oh, yeah. It was then that the eight-year-old stories became bizarre, fragmented, and illogical, Wright said. His stories changed each time he told them. He also changed the subject, quizzing right on math problems and asking her about outer space. Can you die if you go into outer space? He asked. How do you get to space? Do you have to wear a helmet and suit in space? Interesting. Wright believed the eight-year-old did not suffer from a true psychotic disorder. This appears to be an unfortunate and sad case of a child who has been induced into a delusional syst system perpetuated by his mother and potentially reinforced by wow. other relatives. Okay. That's pretty harsh. Yeah. But just hear me out. Okay. Clinical psychologist Joel Schwartz, who evaluated Amons' daughter and older son, came to a similar conclusion. There also appears to be a need to assess the extent to which Amons' daughter may have been unduly influenced by her mother's concerns that the family was exposed to paranormal experiences. 
Emmons' daughter told Schwartz that she saw shadowy figures in the Carolina home, street home. She also said she twice went into trances. Emmons' older son told Schwartz that doors would slam and stuff started moving around. Emmons was also examined several times by psychologists who said she was guarded, but did not seem to be experiencing symptoms of psychosis or thought disorder. When psychologists recommended Amons be assessed to determine whether her relig- religiosity, religiosity may be masking underlying delusional ideations or perpetual disturbances. Those are some big words, a lot, too. A lot of words. Wow. Yeah. So I think placing her religion in that causing because her religion lines up right. with the belief in demonic presences. Right. Like and stuff she's. Like that. She's, she's talking about it so much she's talking and focusing self yes, into it yes right? and focusing so much on it yeah right so they continue the, the kids and amens continued to insist they were possessed by demons dcs set goals for the family one of them stipulated that the children did not discuss demons and being possessed and and take responsibility for their actions they also needed to participate in therapy to address the past behavior They credited Amons for having a close bond with her children, and the agency also said she needed to use alternative forms of discipline not directly related to religion and demon possession. Kind of saying to your kid... Don't use your ointments and... Or or that, or quit being a monster, you little demon, or you're possessed. That's why you're acting that way. Right. Right? You know. So she'd rather them just tell her you're being a brat. Yeah. Start behaving. Yeah. Due to paranormal activity, she had to find a job... In appropriate housing due to the paranormal activity at the house. So they wanted her to move. Yep. Okay. But there's paranormal activity at the house, but they don't think the kids are possessed. Right. They just believe in the paranormal activity exactly. portion of it. Yep. Okay. So, a demonic presence at the house. The group was a bit larger this time. Campbell, Amons, Austin, and two other police officers from the initial visit went back to the Carolina home on, or Carolina Street home on the afternoon of May 10th. The officers... The police officers visited after work, uh, after work hours. They were joined by Magno, two Lake, Lake County officers with a police dog and a DCS family case manager, Samantha Illick. Illick, who was there in an official capacity, told the star she volunteered to go into Washington's place because Washington didn't want to go back into the house. The county officer took his police dog around the home, but the dog didn't show any interest in any particular area, according to the police. Everyone else headed into the basement. Iliak touched some of the strange liquid she saw dripping in the basement and said it felt slippery yet sticky between her fingers. Maginot told police he wanted to check the dirt under the stairs for for a pentagram or personal objects that might have been cursed and buried there. He said the pentagram might indicate a demonic presence and a possible portal to hell. Interesting. That's in the police report as well. Or if someone had died in the house and was buried under the stairs, yes. it could explain paranormal activity, Najna said. One of the police officers dug a four foot by three foot hole beneath the stairs, unearthing a pink, dra- pink press on fingernail, a white pair of panties, a po- political shirt pin, a lid for a small cooking pan, socks with the bottoms cut off the ankles, candy wrappers, and a heavy metal object that looked like a weight for a drapery cord. Police record states. Finding nothing else, those are such random objects. Weird things. Right? Finding nothing else, the officer replaced the dirt and raked it over. Maginot blessed some salt, and he said, the, which he said is the barrier to evil, and spread it under the stairs. Illick said she was, li- was later standing in the living room <clears throat> when the rest of the group, when her left pinky finger started tingling white. She complained it felt broken all of a sudden. Less than 10 minutes later, Illick said she felt like she was having a panic attack and couldn't breathe, so she walked outside to wait for the group. When the priest started questioning Amons inside the house, she complained of a headache and shoulder pain, according to police records. Austin said he left the house at nightfall. Austin, who had been shot at and has investigated murders, rapes, armed robberies during more than three decades on the force, said he wasn't staying in that house past dark. (laughs) I don't blame him. Right. The other officers continued to walk through the home. On the main floor, they noticed an oil-like substance dripping from the Venetian blinds in the bedroom. To make matters worse, they couldn't figure out what it was. And to make sure Campbell or Amons hadn't poured oil on all the blinds, two of the officers used paper towels to clean it off. 
and then sealed the room for 25 minutes and stood nearby so nobody could walk in. When they went back in, the oil had come back. Yeah. So they reappeared. Wow. Huh. Maginot, that's in the police records as well. That's crazy. Maginot told police the liquid was a manifestation of a paranormal or dem demonic presence. He wrote a report detailing his findings and asked Bishop Dale Melchek permission to perform an exorcism on Amens. Maginot and Melchek had never met or had never authorized an exorcism in 21 years as a bishop in the Diocese of Gary. Debbie Bosak, director of communications for the diocese, said she cannot comment on whether Melchek had has ever approved an exorcism for confidentiality reasons. In general, she said such an action would require a bishop's approval. Melchek initially denied the request to do a church-sanctioned exorcism, and the bishop told Maginot to contact other priests who had performed exorcisms. Maginot said he needed other priests to give, the, give him the ritual for a minor exorcism, which does not require church approval, like just a full-blown exorcism, a right. minor right. exorcism. And anybody can do. Or a priest. We aren't doing it. No. <laughs> so... The priest started, he consulted, told him to look up, look it up on the internet. He said he was, he did an intense blessing on the Carolina Street home to expel bad spirits. That same day, Maginot performed a minor exorcism on Amens. The ritual consisted of prayers, statements, and appeals to cast out the demons. Two police officers in Illich, the DCS case ma family case manager, attended the ritual. Illich said she left before, left believing that something was going on, although she wouldn't go as far as saying it was demonic. She said she got the chills during the nearly two-hour rite. We felt like somebody was in. It felt like somebody was in the room. Someone was breathing down your neck. She said. She said she felt a string of. of she had a string of medical problems after visiting at the home. A week after she visited the home for the last time, she got third-degree burns from a motorcycle. Within 30 days, she had also broken three ribs jet skiing, broke a hand when she hit a table, and then broke an ankle running in flip-flops. Jeez. I had friends who, would, who wouldn't talk to me because they believed that something had attached itself to me. Her joking response, I'm already evil. They try to find something that's not <laughs> evil and corrupt it. They wouldn't waste their time with me. So then the, the next step was after a minor ritual, Maginot told Ammons to look up the names of the demons that were tormenting her. Each demon has a name and personality, Maginot said. A name has power, the priest added, and he planned to use those names to fight him. Mm -hmm. Eamon said she and a friend looked up demons' names online by searching for demons that represented problems that the family was having. But she said they only found the she, she found the names that fit. They were because they were sick, lightheaded. They had those dizzy spells, all of those sorts of things. One name, and I don't want to say it, but yeah, don't say it. The one with the B, yeah, ends with Bub. Lord of the Flies, Eamon said, she said they also found names of demons that torture and hurt kids, which she felt explained what happened in the Carolina Street House. Hmm. Eamon said other high-ranking demons were also assigned to her, including lieutenants and sergeants. After the minor rite, Maginot said Bishop Melchak gave him permission to exercise, a full-blown exorcism. Okay. The ritual has is the same as a minor exorcism, but is more powerful because it has the backing of the Catholic Church. Maginot ultimately performed three major exorcisms on Amens, two in English and the last one in Latin. Interesting. During each, Maginot said he praised God and condemned evil. Maginot has said his voice continued to get louder and more forceful until the demon weakened. He said he could tell how strong the demon was by how much Amens convulsed. Two police officers who kept in touch with Maginot since the since the investigation stood nearby and had in case the Amens had to be restrained. Amens said she prayed with Maginot until it became too painful. She felt she said she felt as if it's something inside her was trying to hold on and inflict pain at the same time. She said it was different from the natural pain because it felt intense, as intense as giving birth. Wow. Wow. I was hurting all over from the inside out, she, she remembers. I'm trying to do my best and be strong. Eventually, Maginot said Amens fell asleep. She said that that was the demon's way of lessening the ritual's effect. Interesting. In between the second and third exorcisms, Maginot said he went on a retreat. A woman who assisted him with some exorcisms helped him helped set up a backup plan in case Amons had problems while he was gone. The woman wrote a long de demon name 
Maginot said he can't remember which one it was on a piece of paper and tucked it in an envelope. Then she surrounded it with blessed salt. If Amons had problems, the woodman would burn the, el- the envelope. Okay. By this time, Amons and her mother had moved into in- moved to Indianapolis. They left. Right. But they drove back to- for the exorcisms and court hearings to, to get her kids, kids back. back. Yeah. Maginot said she he had blessed the family's new home to prevent more problems. But Amons called while Maginot was on his retreat, complaining of bad dreams. So the woman burned the envelope. She saved the ashes to burn later at church, at a church bonfire. After that, her nightmares ended. Wow, it's crazy. So at that point, she started getting her kids back. It was June. So this had only been a handful of months that all of this had happened, right? Heard, right. Um, so Maginot said he prayed and, and berated the demons in Latin rather than English. There was a final exorcism at this point. So police officers did not attend. So Maginot said his brother stood guard. Maginot said Amons convulsed while he condemned the demons, but did not convulse during the prayer. When she fell asleep, he said words of thanksgiving. It would have been the la- It would be the last time Amon saw Maginot. She said her mother drove back to Indianapolis, where they say they now live without fear. Amon's home, old home on Carolina Street, it became an object of local curiosity. Mm-hmm. So much so that the landowner, the owner Charles Reed, called the Gary Police Department and asked soft to ask officers to stop driving by the house because it was scaring his new tenant. They're probably like driving by and then like, that's the haunt. That's yeah, that's, that's the, the house. house. Yeah. That's the house Joe was in during those exorcisms. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. So he said he, he, he said there were no problems in that home before or after Amon's family lived there. I thought I had heard it all, said Reed, who had been the landlord for 33 years. This was a new one to me. My belief system was, has a hard time jumping over that bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Well, he wasn't there also. Right. He's hearing, you know, secondhand Absolutely. stories. So he's like. I don't know if I can get behind this or not. Right. Nobody's ever had problems, so. This, yeah, this one, this, I don't know what I would, if I just had a house that I was like, all right, I'm going to rent it out. I would think somebody nowadays with what stuff we've read, watched, I'd be like, somebody's doing something in my house. Right. And causing this. Right. Right. So, you don't want to invite something like that. Anymore. No. So, she has custody of her three children as in, she retained, regained custody in November of 2012, about six months after they had been removed. DCS continued to check in on the children and to make sure they were going to school until the case was closed in February. So everything was good. She said that they screamed and jumped up and down when she picked him up from the DCS. So it's just awesome, right? Um, Yeah, the family is no longer is no longer fixated solely on religion to explain or cope with their children's behavior issues said the uh, doctor that I can't say his last name. Okay. Um, and her supervisor wrote in a request for dismissal of wardship dated in January of 2013. For her part, Eamon said it was not the psychologist who resolved her, her problems, but God did. Yes. When you hear something like this, she said, don't assume it's not real because I lived it. I know it's real. Yeah. It's crazy. That's the story. So there's like... It- if you guys haven't seen it, you need to go watch the Zach Baggins because it goes even to a little like the demon house. Everybody who has gone in there, like that one woman said she broke her pinky. She broke her ankle. She broke some ribs. She did, you know, all these things. She's not the only one that that happened to. Yeah. Everybody that went into that house to try to work on do fix it or do something. Fi- or yeah. Anything. Helping the family yeah. or, you know, the getting rid of the demonic presence mm-hmm. that something happened to all of them. Right. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's a great. It, this, it's also he where, eventually ended up knocking down yeah, the house. So remember, he stayed there and he, yes, bol- he like blocked the door. That's and, what I'm saying. You need to go. W- up yeah, his eyes. go check it out if you haven't watched it. It's it's long. It's, it's like, like two hours, hours but, um, but it's definitely worth it. And, and it goes it demoed. To, and I'll have a photo. Of and they have demolition. some of the people on there. Um, she would not. The cop was in there. The cop was in there, but she would not go back on camera. Right. Um, she didn't want to bring anything with either. that back into her life. So she was like, nope, not participating. Yeah. Her brother talked to them. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah I remember so. they traveled to try and, to try and interview. Yeah. So that Good is... Good story, babe. That's gone in a little bit more in depth from it from just the family perspective. Right. So that's a great, that's a great perspective. Thank Absolutely. you for sharing that. Sure. So that's the exorcisms of Latoya Amons. That was really good. Yeah. So thank you guys so much. I know that was a long one, but I think it's well worth the, Absolutely. the story. So I appreciate it. Thank you, honey. For, of course. For Thanks for entertaining me. out on that one. Absolutely. 
And that's it for this show. Go out and like and subscribe again. Sharing is Share caring. It. So of course her new thing, sharing is caring. I'm gonna get it get our stickers made for that. So <laughs> thanks so much. Cheers. Bye, Have guys. a great night.